Yeah, and we are live. Yeah, cool. So welcome everyone. Uh, it's evening, evening. Uh, really good to see you here. Uh, thank you to join us. Um, and we have a lot of things to do today to cover, to talk about. Um, so first, uh, let's start by talking a little bit about us. So uh, for, the, for, the, for those who are joining us for the first time, uh, welcome to Android Academy. Um, we're a huge community, over 5,000 members, uh, over four different uh, places uh, with one goal to give everyone an uh, opportunity to learn uh, about Android development for free, to achieve the goals, to achieve uh, new heights, to become the expert of uh, everything that related to Android. Uh, I want to really special thing about our community that um, it's, it's really about in opening the door uh, and helping others uh, to learn and, and really become the knowledgeable. And one of the important things that there is no such a thing as a silly or dummy questions. Every question is important. So um, feel free to ask anything in the chat, to, to share, uh, to share your thoughts, um, and to ask the question of uh, our speakers about the topics or any unrelated topics things also. Um, so uh, what are we going to have today? Um, so first, uh, as you notice, uh, uh, we're speaking here in English. Uh, and now for some of the communities that are regular for the Russian or to the Hebrew, uh, it's not really the native uh, language, uh, but we thought it could be really good to collaborate between different Android academies in the world and to make it much more accessible. Uh, and the English is a very common language that most of us are speaking. Uh, and also we're like kind of uh, speaking very, uh, let's say, uh, simple English version. Uh, so I hope it's going to be really easy to understand about what we're talking and uh, people will be able to learn. Um, so what we're going to have today, um, we have three guests, three people uh, that are joining us uh, to share their knowledge, their wisdom. So we have Ben uh, from uh, Google that will uh, help us to understand what is the modern under development and uh, how to become uh, in experiencing that. Uh, and then uh, Mihail will tell us about the uh, one time sign in. And uh, the session will close by Pavel. Uh, then he will deep dive in the what is the notification, how to work with the bubbles, and what is the shortcuts. And we'll show a lot of a lot of um, insights that he find out uh, when preparing this lecture. Um, Small uh, surprise. So also, we it's it's um it's five session out of like we right now doing the second session out of five sessions, uh, all of them under the single umbrella of uh, getting learn about new Android eleven thing. Um, so I'm happy to share with you that the next session will be on the fourth of the August at the same time, and we will have three additional guests. Uh, one of them also from the Google. It's uh, Manuel Vivo. He will going to talk about uh, Dagger Hilt. And also Alex uh, Bikov from Evolute going to talk about the pigeonation, the new version, and Dmitry going to talk about the uh, startup activity result and many more. Um, so uh, you already can register under this link. Just go to the android-11.jetpackeventbyte.com and register for our next event. And uh, the last but not the least, a uh, very important thing. Uh, we invest a lot in preparing these uh, lectures. We invest a lot about the presentations and doing the dry runs and, and thinking about all the aspects of how to share this knowledge. We will be really grateful uh, to learn and, and improve ourselves. Uh, and we need your feedback for that. So please, 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 uh, I will share the link in our chat. Go to this form. It's really short, five questions will help us a lot to learn, to improve, and, and give you much more, uh, more value uh, okay, in time. So um, long story short, uh, before we begin, uh, every session uh, should start with it. So we have three speakers, and I thought about nice icebreaker. Um, so uh, the icebreaker, and it's uh, to all three speakers, is actually uh, to select the emoji that best describes you and also to give us why. Um, so I'm going to introduce the first speaker. Uh, it's Ben. 
Hi, Ben. Hi, Jonathan. Uh, Good seeing you. Good seeing everybody else as well. And thanks for having us in English. <laughs> Thank you for you to joining us and also contributing your time. Um, so before you're going to deep dive into your session, what's, uh, what's the emoji and why? I think it would be either bicycle or shruggy. Um, shruggy is because most of the time when I don't know stuff, I just send it shruggies. Um, other than that, I like to cycle, uh, be it with my family or on my own quite a bit, not for sports, but just to get around, um, which is in some cultures, a very normal thing in the UK, not so much. So I just like, like I am go on my bike and go into town instead of using a car. So I think cycling is one of the emojis that I, uh, would be mostly identifiable with. Cool. Thank you for sharing. So, um, go for it. The stage is yours. <laughs> Showtime. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Um, yeah, so, well, hi, I'm Ben. I'm here to talk a little bit about modern Android development. I'm part of the Android Developer Relations team uh, based in London. And like I said, thank you very much for uh, having the sessions in English, because this way I can join in as well. Uh, English is not my first language either. But um, like I said, I'm very grateful to being able to uh, talk to everybody here in English and hoping that everybody understands um, my pace, which might sometimes just be a bit fast. But uh, well, we'll see about this. Like I said, I will be talking a bit about modern Android development. Um, well, but before we go where we are and where we're going from here, let's talk a little bit about how we got here with, um, well, we call it classic Android development. Classic Android development, essentially, well, let's see, take a look at a couple of things, the behind the language, the tools, the APIs, and the way that the applications were distributed in the first place before we actually got to modern Android development. And taking a look back, Let's start with a small history lesson. So um, when uh, Android came out with the SDK M3, we had the Java programming language, we had uh, platform APIs only, we had the Eclipse plugins, and we had APKs as the distribution mechanism. Um, then we shipped in uh, 2008 uh, towards 2009 1.0 of Android. And then there were more platform APIs coming in. Then um, in 2014, 2013, we um, announced Android Studio. And in 2017, we said that we we're going to support Kotlin as a second um, as a second language, as an officially supported language on, on Android. And in uh, 2018, 20, sorry, 2017 as well, we said our Arch components is launching as a thing um, as it is right now with uh, Android X and Jetpack. Also in uh, 2019, we uh, made app bundles publicly available to uh, users to use that as well. Um, sorry, my clicker is not helping me, so I'm going to switch over to my keyboard. Um, so app bundles as the um, distribution mechanism. So let's dive into each of these uh, different sections here. So firstly, let's take a look at the classic language. Language was the Java programming language, which has a huge developer base, which is really good for um, for somebody to start, get started with, because you already have developers that um, that know the language. And I at university started with Java programming language as well. So um, that's one of the languages that got taught in, in many universities. Also, there is um, a lot of existing and free tooling available. There's also existing libraries with best practices and patterns that are available. And there is also very robust and automatic memory management when you compare that to um, non-garbage collected languages such as C++. For tools, we had Eclipse and the Android Developer Toolkit, which um, was firstly free to use for everyone, which is really great. We had a very familiar developer experience for folks that already were be using Eclipse. And it was free. Well, that's really good for folks to be well also creating their applications on and just dabbling into it. Um, and we had integration of new tools into the IDE through the um, developer toolkit. And did I say it was free? So um, there's a, there you have it, a couple of really good things about the classic tools uh, for uh, Eclipse and the Android developer toolkit. For APIs, we had really good ways to, to do that with the platform APIs, which had a lot of new uh, frequent releases. In the beginning, really frequent releases, like half yearly and even faster than this. Um, and we had new functionality that was added in each release. And as you know how it works is you add new stuff uh, that should be working. Sometimes you add stuff that doesn't work. So we already had um, a lot of bug fixes that, um, well, over time you had to deal with those um, and a couple of quirks throughout the platform releases. So we had bug fixes in there as well. So um, a short time of this. Uh, so in 2008, we shipped 1.0, 1.0, early 2009, 1.1. Quick succession 1.5, 1.6, 2.0. That was all 2009 before 2010. 2010 with uh, Android 2.2, 2.3, slowing down the pace a little bit. 
um, with half yearly and then yearly annual, annual releases, which is the cadence that we currently have um, uh, where we are now with Android 10 and now uh, the Android 11 betas that are out at the moment, which we're looking at in 2020. Um, also for distribution, the next pillar that we're looking at, uh, we had APKs, which you still have installed on the device. Uh, the application packages are basically um, your code, your resources, and everything um, zipped in, in a way that uh, you can that the that is easily distributable and um, packaged that it is um, easily easily um, installable on the device. Um, th one of the things we had a problem with is if you have more configurations, so you want to address multiple users' devices or multiple um, different um, type types of your application within one APK, well, one APK wasn't possible. You had either mo more APKs, well, one APK was possible, but that would, it would grow in size, um, sometimes substantially, and that would also yield to uh, result in a lot of problems. Speaking of problems, well, we had a couple of uh, problems that we had classically uh, cl in, a, in the classic Android development world. And um, let's talk a little bit about these before we go ahead and talk about the actual part of that con of the presentation, which is modern Android development. So classic with uh, the Java programming language, uh, it is a good development language, but it is kind of verbose. For tooling, we had the, like I said, Eclipse and the Android developer toolkit. It was difficult to customize. It was really hard for us to do the things in a way that we wanted them to. And the tools that we had and the sub-tools that were there from, from other providers as well, they had a lot of different UIs and patterns, and it was really hard to have um, a very good development experience with that. And the core IDE wasn't actively and approved in a way that uh, we actually uh, were able to, to help out and control with that. So there's a couple of things in there as well. So for APIs, let's take a look at that. Um, we had the platform. Well, yeah, uh, we'd already talked about that. Uh, one of the things is the problem is that the um, you as a developer are limited by the by the users actually getting the releases, and as you know, this can take time for the user to to catch up with everything. So that takes a little while for for you to actually adopt everything as well. And if it is adopted, well, that there's like a lot of uh, that can be a long time until things actually dribble down to um, to the users where it makes sense for you or for your company to uh, catch up with that. So that means that it was difficult to adopt uh, new technologies and fixes in the platform that were there because the users were still on the old releases. And also, it was complicated. So we had lifecycle in there, which is one of the things that, um, well, everybody that has looked at the lifecycle di diagrams knows what it's like to stare at the abyss, at least a little bit. Um, and then there's storage and navigation. All of those things were, uh, well, complicated, to, let's say the least. Um, another thing for the applications uh, that were di di distributed as APKs directly, well, we had monolithic APKs. Um, they were handling all uh, possibilities. In many cases, the um, resources that were on the device weren't actually used. So you had um, resources for each display entity, but they weren't used by the user at all because usually, well, the screen size doesn't magically change um, in a device. And even if it would, then the density could, could remain the same. Um, and if you had, didn't have a monolithic APK, on the other hand, you would have a uh, well, a lot of APKs that you would have to handle. And everybody that has dealt with uh, multiple APKs and the uh, things like version code changes that you had to do with that knows how much time that can take and how much headache that can cause. And um, well, with all these problems and all the all the issues that we that we talked about, um, we came up with an answer, which we call modern Android development. Modern Android development as an idea has been floating around for a long time. And as you saw in the beginning, it's not just a thing that happened magically overnight, but step by step. We just decided that it's now a good time to actually talk about it in a coherent uh, manner, in a coherent fashion. And modern Android development, what we describe as this, is development tools, APIs, language, and distribution technologies recommended by the Android team to help developers to be productive and create better apps that run across billions of devices. Well, nice slogan, all that, but let's see it a bit in action. Firstly, well, nice diagram, nice, nice graph here. Um, well, let's take a look at it as a house under the roof of modern Android development. We have a foundation, because without a foundation, every house would just, well, look at the Leaning Tower of, Pi of Pisa, for example. Um, we have a foundation, which is the Android platform and Google Play, on the other hand, as a distribution mechanism. We have, uh, on top of that, we have four pillars. Uh, one of them is the language. Then we have the tools, the APIs, and the distribution. And we have four new things, um, well, not really new, new, but four things that we base this on. So one of them is the language. As language, we say Kotlin is the way forward. And if we take a look back again, um, this is where we uh, say this is, the, this is the history of, of Kotlin on Android. 
uh, we start. We took a look at uh, Kotlin in general, where even before 1.0 came out, uh, and that 1.0 came out in 2016, a lot of developers already were taking it up. But it was the early adopters, and people were talking with us and saying, "Well, Google, you might get it. what about Kotlin? What about Kotlin? What about Kotlin?" So in 2017, we decided that we um, officially support Kotlin as a programming language on Android. And I remember being there uh, in the audience. There was a lot of uh, cheers, a lot of applause. Everybody was really happy already in these early days. And fast forward a couple of years, um, we decided to go Kotlin first on Android. Um, and now we even say that Coroutines is a preferred solution for using Kotlin on Android. Um, so this is where we currently are. But why did we choose Kotlin? Well, Kotlin is an expressive language. So that means we have to write less boilerplate to achieve the right things. It has null safety built in and type system that is really strong. There's interoperability, so seamlessly interrupts with Java. Uh, and you can easily migrate from a Java code base to a Kotlin uh, code base, even step by step, because of the Java bytecode's compatibi compatibility. And you have structured concurrency with uh, coroutines, which we now said is the preferred solution for, for asynchronous tasks. Uh, so you can create elegant and asynchronous programming. Well, Let's take a look at a very short example of why Kotlin is really a, a fun language to write, uh, write code in. So well, I like it a lot. But yeah, let's take a look at this. It's um, basically just a snippet that you could write everywhere in within your application. So in the onCreate, what we have here is, uh, as a parameter, that could be null. So nullability is inherited, is, is, is part of the type system and inherited in that. Uh, so just the question mark on t uh, at the end of a type, it tells uh, the compiler that this might be null. And so every time you see that there's a question mark, you actually know whether there is null or not. And this is um, hard. It's a, it's a hard uh, dependency by the compiler. So you know whenever this is uh, not, whenever something could be null or not. Another thing is lambdas that are um, so you basically have possibilities to um, write code in a more concise fashion there as well for your listeners and the likes like that. So this makes your callbacks more succinct and readable. Another thing is um, general extension functions. So uh, in this case, we have the capitalize function on the string type. Um, so that essentially means that um, without actually having to extend string, uh, we get the possibility to have functions after that. And you can add this to any, any class that you have there already. And you can add your own extension functions. Um, the Kotlin uh, standard library provides a lot of uh, extension functions that you can use as well. And you can use template expressions. Uh, with template expressions, you basically get compile time checked expressions inside of strings. So that means you can make sure that, uh, well, you can write them in an easier way and a, a more succinct way. And um, on the other hand, you get string formatting a lot easier. And it is compile time safe. So you know that what you're writing in your code actually will be evaluated at compile time and not later on, uh, leading to less crashes there as well. And another thing is that properties are built into language. So you can't confuse uh, between private and public fields or private and public getters and setters. So in that case, uh, uh, back background tint list, you can just set the background tint list via saying uh, equals. But in, underneath the hood, you would be uh, accessing the uh, setter for that uh, where it's available. So why Kotlin? Another thing why we chose Kotlin as a, um, as a programming language is speed. So speed of development, because you have to write less code. And the language evolves a lot faster for us in Android as well. So we're constantly improving uh, runtime library and um, uh, and, the, and the overall uh, language together with uh, JetBrains on the Kotlin Foundation. And um, Coroutines, for example, was uh, experimental last year. Now we fully support it and go even as far and saying this is the, this is the, the, um, the uh, supported way and the preferred way to create uh, asynchronous code on Android. Flow is supported for screen and values back from coroutines as well already, which um, is uh, well still fairly new, but we're already uh, can take these things on and take, can take in feedback as well. Also, uh, well, extension extension methods that you can write yourself or that we can provide through uh, KTX, which I'll talk about in a second, um, evolve outside the language as well. And if we take a look at uh, the uptake of, develop of Kotlin, developers seem to like it as well. So 60% 60 60 of professional Android developer uh, developers use Kotlin, and more than 70% of the top 1,000 Android apps uh, contain Kotlin code already. Um, within Google, uh, we support Kotlin, for example, with um, some initiatives like symbol processing that we use uh, with uh, KVT. Uh, we have tooling in there, which we have, for example, we work on lint checks dedicated to Kotlin. We have a dedicated compiler team. Um, that improves, for example, R8 uh, for optimizing uh, the, the bytecode for, for Kotlin. Uh, we work on the uh, processing speed with the simple processing. Um, we work on a lot of things there. 
Also, uh, when we take a look at the annotations that we added to the Android platform, uh, there is annotations like recently nullable or recently non-null. Um, these will throw a, a build warning rather than an error. So that means that you have time to migrate from uh, from things that might have that recently have been introduced as a nullable or non-nullable type. And later on in an, in an upcoming release, we can then uh, make this a compile error. And we do this as well by changing those over time from recently nullable, for example, to recently uh, to, to a nullable. So that means where you actually get an error in your build. So this way, um, we get type safety on the one hand, but also give you time to migrate over from um, old, uh, from, from the classic system to, to new ways with uh, the annotation that we provide there. Um, another thing that we do is, like I mentioned earlier, is the Kotlin extension libraries. Um, so that means that we improve platform APIs outside of the platform releases. Um, so for example, if we take a look at the uh, bitmap API, so you can create a bitmap uh, with like all the data that's in there. And then we have the drawable API where we can draw uh, uh, something on the canvas. And the code that you would have to write is um, essentially, you would have to create the bounds and set the bounds. Then you would have to create the bitmap. Then you have to draw and then set the bounds on that uh, the drawable as well. Um, that is a lot of code. So we created an extension function, which we call to bitmap on a drawable. So that means in drawable, you just say to bitmap uh, with the width, height, and the configuration, and that will return you a bitmap. So all you have to write is drawable to bitmap, and then you have your uh, then you have the same result. So that is a lot less code. That means that also the uh, there's a lot less errors that you are likely to make um, because of a um, shared library that we can provide you with, and um, all the issues that uh, we might encounter, and everybody might encounter, are being fixed in a single location rather than all over the place. Another thing that we do is we create Kotlin-specific APIs, for example, for Room, Work Manager, or Paging 3, which is uh, rewritten in Kotlin directly, including coroutines as well, and also Jetpack Compose, uh, which is a new toolkit, on a, a new, new UI toolkit for Android, and it's completely written in Kotlin with compiler uh, adjustments as well for that. We also work on uh, docs, samples, and training. So what we do have for, for Kotlin is a set of specific documentation. We do have a lot of samples that are either written in Kotlin or um, specifically tailored towards Kotlin. Um, and we also do have code labs, courses, articles, and videos that get you started and diving deeper into Kotlin. Um, and for example, the Kotlin vocabulary series, which is, uh, well, all of the above that you can take a look at. Let's take a look at the modern tools. We have Android Studio as the IDE for Android developers. And we started off in 2013, where we announced Android Studio as the default and the new um, Android IDE. And in 2016, uh, late 2016, we then went with the next step on uh, one of the things that we said is well, we basically we deprecated the support for the Eclipse Android Developer Toolkit. And we also introduced the constraint layout editor. So we have been involving from there ever since with more things with Android Studio 3.0, Kotlin support, CPU network profiler uh, stuff in there. Uh, we added D8 as a uh, default text in 3.1. 3.2 was uh, synthetic stress profilers and energy uh, profilers as well. And we continued adding uh, new features like mitigation editor, view binding directly in there as well, or even the motion editor, and uh, even more stuff with the with the uh, these, uh, with the more recent releases as well. Um, so as you see, we can uh, easily make it possible with Android Studio to just go and create new stuff, new editors, new ways that we couldn't do with the with the old tool tools that we had at hand beforehand. Um, so, well, let's take a look at um, one of the things that we can be doing in there as well. So we have possibilities with uh, Android Studio, which is built on IntelliJ, also well created by, by JetBrains and powered by them, is uh, we have um, extremely powerful code refactoring that you can use. So essentially, you can just pull out functions and move around them with, a, with keystrokes. Um, take a look at a couple of the videos that Tor Nobi made uh, at several IOs. He is a whiz in, in Android Studio shortcuts. Um, also, we have a possibility to create more uh, future-proof tools because of the extensible UI that Android Studio provides us with. And we have a couple of core plugins that are being actively developed both by JetBrains and by us in Google. And we have a very tight integration with uh, both Kotlin and Gradle. And uh, we also, with tools, we create uh, lint checks, quick fixes all the time, and we create more of them as they go along. And we can include them in libraries um, that we create as well. But most importantly, it integrates with uh, both the existing and new APIs. So for example, navigation and layouts, uh, as well as data binding or room, we can create the tools to make sure that the editors are there, that the um, all the things that ne are needed there, the, the checks are there, that all the compiler things are there that we would, would need to have. With all this and tools, let's take a look at the modern APIs, Android Jetpack. 
is uh, in the modern world, the APIs are unbundled. So that means you can use them across releases. They are backported wherever possible and wherever uh, it makes sense to that. Also, um, we have, well, a lot of them. So last time I checked, it was about 83. So it might have already been more. Um, there's more of them coming out every so and so often. So we're not going to take a look at everything with just part of Android Jetpack. So it, in 2017, the first thing that we said, well, is uh, we said we're going to uh, create constraint layout. And constraint layout 1.0 was one of the big uh, APIs that came out for that. So instead of using frame layouts, instead of using linear layouts, relative layouts, we said uh, use constraint layout. Also, uh, architecture components in 2017, where we said this is the set of components with uh, life cycles, view model, room. And there's more of them that came in after, ever since. And in 2018, we also said, OK, we now, now call this Jetpack under the umbrella of Jetpack. And uh, we included more libraries with paging, navigation, work manager, all of which have um, spouted new libraries ever since and new things that came into that as well. In Late 2018, uh, late 2018, we also introduced the material design components, which um, are the, well, it's your way to use uh, material design on Android, which has evolved ever since as well with new versions and new uh, paradigms. So uh, you can use them backported as well, not just in that case from Android Lollipop and above, but you can also um, use the new stuff on the way back um, as low as you as you can go with that as well. Um, not sure what the lowest is. I think we're, we're still um, at 14. Well, that might be wrong, but um, I think that's it. And um, last year at I.O., we announced uh, uh, one of the new things, which is uh, an, our unbundled UI toolkit with Jetpack Compose. Also, we announced uh, Camera X, a way that um, the camera can be a lot easier to use for user developers, because we heard that that caused a lot of pain points in the past. And this year, uh, we also introduced a motion layout and motion editor as new APIs that you can make uh, animations and motion of uh, items on your screen a lot easier than they were in the past. Well, uh, one of the things, like I said, uh, staring at a lifecycle diagram can be a bit confusing, a bit like staring at the abyss. Um, so there is a lot of back and forth, and like well, the path might be a bit uh, well, not as as uh, straight as a, as a just a straight road, but like a lot of turns that you can take, and you have to know what's going on. And well, there were a lot of uh, hooks that you had to to implement just to make sure that you know where you are in the state and what's going on. Um, well, uh, we ch we decided to change that, and we decided to uh, introduce a, a life cycle as an API for that, which um, with app compat activity and uh, fragments as well, they are both life cycle owners. And you can get a life cycle object, and you can be observer of that life cycle object. So that means uh, you can just create a new obs observer object, um, and you can create and you can can listen to the changes there. And that means, for example, you can do things like you can annotate um, that a function should start should run at a specific point in time uh, in the life cycle. So in this case, uh, on start, something should happen. Or you can check that um, stuff is actually happening only at a specific point. So that, that would be life cycle current state is at least, where you check that you are at least in this state or later on in the life cycle in order to execute this. So that makes it um, easier to react to life cycle events. Speaking of well, life cycle events, and um, the way that you um, navigate between, well, the, the way that things are happening between the UI and um, your, your data that is underneath that. Um, let's take a look at how we did that with uh, live data and view models. So you have the view, the user interface, which is your views, your fragments, your activity uh, on the one side. And on the other hand, we have your, our data. And for the data, we introduced view model um, as a class that uh, allows you to handle um, Handle data over across orientation changes and make sure that your stuff is not being removed. Where you uh, basically make it make it easier to not have um, well uh, memory leaks, for example, or uh, context leaks or things like that. Um, so this essentially helped us to uh, separate all the data from the UI. And how do we do this? So um, any element in the UI can register to be an observer of changes in a live data within a view model. And uh, they will get results on change back. So that means whenever a live data changes or the, any value in there changes, you get the data back. And that can be sent back to your UI. And you can react on this already. So that will give you a more reactive approach on what's going on. And also, um, it's a lot easier to write in, in many cases than writing a lot of callbacks and just punching through a lot of different layers of your own architecture that uh, well, I certainly had written in the past. Um, but we also. Um, I want to make sure that uh, stuff just doesn't work on several parts, but we try and spin an overall arch through um, the APIs that we create. So we decided, well, why not make Room, our uh, database uh, layer for, that, for, uh, for Android, 
work with that as well. So we have, in this case, SQLite on the bottom. We have Room as a data uh, as a, as a DAO on top of that. And on top of that, you can communicate with the live data. So that means that uh, Room communicates with your SQLite database. And Room also, on the other hand, uh, provides you with new data that comes back. Um, you can do a lot of things with it. So you can either have your, your CRUD data with that. So you, you create, insert, update, or delete. Uh, some some data in your database, but you also can create your own queries where you can get, in this case, get all from a uh, from from a specific table. You can get uh, you can get very creative with all the things you do, and also it's compile time checked. So that means that you don't have to write your own stuff um, and have to run it before um, it it might crash or not. Um, but you actually get the the checks at compile time already through the annotations and the processor there. And you have easy functions that give you type safety on top of that as well. So with all this, um, there we introduce the things that, things in between, like uh, paging. With paging, essentially, that means that if you have um, if you have a lot of data, that means that you have well, you don't want to call everything like get all, but you want to make sure that you call get all and then just give parts of that step by step back to the user through the paging library. So that, it, that would mean that you can get return a page list, and that page list just uh, gives you steps by steps by steps, rather than um, just dumping everything into your view and uh, into, view, uh, into your user interface. And you would have to deal with that. It just gives you several steps of this. And you can then uh, ask for more as you reach the end of that uh, displayed items. So they're all built to work together. And we also work uh, on things like, so like they're all lifecycle aware. So view model and life data are lifecycle aware. So that means that you avoid leaks in there. It allows you to update data from uh, for your uh, elements through observers and observables. Uh, room then accesses, uh, can, can be accessed through the uh, through life data and the, uh, the view model. So that means that you can communicate there as well. So this gives you a lot more separation for, uh, from your, your UI layer. And Room also uses coroutines and flow where possible. So that means that it keeps your access of the database off the UI thread, which is pretty cool because you don't want to block the UI thread. That would lead to junk and also to a very unsatisfactory user experience. Um, another thing is also all the uh, architecture components are RxJava friendly. So that means we don't just think about um, we, we don't just think about uh, Kotlin developers, but we also think about folks that use RxJava for their reactive programming. So well. Uh, the examples here don't show this, but yeah, it, it works. Just trust me on this. We make sure that, that it works. So we integrate uh, the things that we're doing tightly with the tools. Like I said earlier, that's one of the things that we can do. So we do this. Um, so if you create a new um, activity, a bit new basic activity, that gives you possibility to create this with uh, the navigation architecture component. And within the navigation architecture component, you get um, these nice graphs through the navigation editor. So that means, in this case, you can navigate from the first fragment to the second fragment and back through two buttons. Um, but not just this nice graph. Underneath, there is a data structure. This is how it's represented um, to Android while at compile time. So you have a couple of fragments with IDs that um, have destinations. And um, take a look at the, at the documentation of that and the samples. If you want to dive into the navigation deeply, I heavily recommend it because it makes uh, well navigation a lot easier on Android. That's what it's supposed to do. Um, but I'll also give you a brief intro on a couple of things there. So in order to use it, um, so basically you call a find nav controller on your activity or your fragment uh, through extension functions. You can do it as well. Um, then you navigate from an action, in this case, from the first fragment to the second fragment. And that would happen, in this case, on a, uh, on a button click. So after you declare everything in your XML file, all you have to do in order to navigate from one point to another um, is called uh, the navigate function. And the navigation library knows how to do this particular navigation and does all of this for you. And uh, for navigation, also, you can pass uh, arguments between destinations, as you could before, through intents or otherwise. You can use navigation arguments there as well. Um, there, you can easily implement a single activity UIs. Um, you don't have to, but you can easily do that with a very simplified fragment management, where, fragment management, where you don't have to integrate interact with the fragment manager yourself. But all of this is taken care for for you as well. The up and back handling is consistent and easy to do as well because the navigation builds its back stack and knows how things are being worked on uh, between there as well. And we also support a dynamic feature a dynamic feature module. So that means that you can um, download and install dynamic features in the background without actually having to write neither the navigation code nor the gating for checking whether a dynamic feature module is already downloaded. Well, that's one of the libraries that we work on. Uh, another one is uh, Work Manager. So let's give you a quick, a quick glance of Work Manager. You can run deferrable and guaranteed background work with Work Manager. Um, 
it's not a replacement for exact work, like a alarm manager, but it's work. It's a replacement for pretty much everything else that runs in the background. It doesn't have to be um, at a specific time. Well, if you're not writing an alarm clock, then this is for you. It is compatible down backwards to API level 14, and it supports periodic tasks, chained and sequence parallel tasks, and defined execution constraint, as well as uh, immediate tasks as well, which are not part of this presentation, but um, well, keep an eye out for stuff coming up soon. Um, Uh, so a couple of use cases for, for Work Manager. Uh, you can have, like I said, concurrent and sequence tasks. So if we go for a concurrent task, in this case, uh, there would be a top bar here. It would be filtering an image over uh, filtering three images. And we only do this, in this case, when the battery is not low. And after this has happened, after the images have been filtered, um, the chain, this the next step, would be the storage isn't low. So that would be the compression um, where it would be taking place. And then the constraint, if you are in an unmetered network, that would be uploaded. You can be very complex and very uh, very creative in the way that you, you use it. And you can make sure that you are doing stuff in a way that's really good for the user because you're uh, making sure that the resources that are available are being uh, well, shared, shared responsibly by uh, you and your application with everybody else that is on the on the device because well, no application runs on it as own on the device, but there's a lot of things going on uh, simultaneously, and uh, that's kind of one of the things for us to make it easier for you to uh, well be a good citizen when you work in the background. For Work Manager, one of the things that we said is like, well, this is how you define it. Uh, you basically create your own worker. In this case, it's a filter worker. Um, and then you can override the do work function. Uh, that's in the uh, coil routine worker. So that means that you're already in the background. And then you just uh, do some stuff, and uh, you execute your business logic. And then you say, this has been successful. You return result success. And you can pass some data with that as well. So you can, in that result, um, get everything back already that you want to get back. Or if there's an, there's an error, you just say, nope, this doesn't work. You just return result failure. Um, for foreground services, so if you want to run stuff immediately, all you have to do is um, before you do some work, you call set foreground with the foreground info, and then you say, well, after that, you do the work, and then you return result success if it worked. If it didn't, then you return the result failure. Another library that we're talking about uh, that, we, that we want to talk about is Camera X. Uh, with Camera X, uh, is we um, address a lot of the pain points that developers had in the first place. It works across about 94% of Android devices since API level 21. It delivers consistent output across devices, which was one of the key pain points for developers. And it's a lot easier to use than uh, further than previous and classic Android APIs around camera. We built it out in a couple of use cases. One of them is preview. The other one is image analysis. And the third one is capture. So preview means basically you want to take a photo. You don't really need the higher resolution. You just want a preview of this. Image analysis means that you want to do some processing, run some algorithms against it, or like object detection or um, augmented reality. And the third one is capturing, basically just easily taking a photo and saving it to disk rather than just displaying it to the user. You just easily save that disk. So let's take a look at the capture use case. Capturing a um, capturing an image is very straightforward. You basically create your image capture builder, say this is the target resolution, in this case 600 by 800. You build that, and then you bind it to your lifecycle that's currently run, that's, that, you, that you have available. And then you just say, take picture. And that's it. Like these couple of well, three lines of code, if we're like, kind of skewing that a little bit and assuming that we're in an actual editor, uh, with three lines of code, you will get a picture taken straight away, rather than writing a lot more code and making sure that all the error cases are handled and all this. So that's one of the cool things that we can do with modern APIs. So um, let's close off the API section. Uh, we create new releases frequently. So that means really, really frequently, a lot fre more frequent than we could any platform releases. Uh, new APIs are in development constantly. You can take a look at the new APIs as they're coming out. It, being an alpha, um, you can download them from Maven, Google.com, and play around with them, even as they are very, very early. So Jetpack Compose is one of those libraries that is uh, still very early in development, but you can already play around with it. We also have Hilt available. We have paging. Those are a couple, just a couple of things that are in development. Um, and well, you know there's more to come all over the time. And you can just take a look at uh, all the things from the get-go. Um, also, well, it is uh, Jetpack Week, so keep an eye out on the things that we do on our social channels this week, because there's uh, well some th fun things I had. After closing this off, I would like to talk a little bit about uh, distributing Android uh, uh, modern Android app distribution. We introduced the Android App Bundle, which is the publishing format for Android applications now. So that means instead of uh, publishing an APK, you would able you would you are able to publish an Android App Bundle, and the Play Store or uh, every store that would implement this is capable of then taking the Android App Bundle through Bundle Tool and um, creating the set of APKs that can be installed on the user's device. So uh, well, let's go a bit of the history here again. In um, 
I.O. at 2018, we said we're launching Android App Bundles. And why did we do it? One of the things is, uh, well, only three in 10 phones have, well, well, three in 10 phones have about less than one gigabyte of free internal space. Much of that space is uh, wasted by resources that aren't being used, or maybe even features that aren't being used. Well, if there, if your storage constraint, so if your user has a constraint in storage, your users are twice as likely to uninstall an application rather than users with free storage. As you can see, if you have eight gigabytes free, that's our one like between six and eight gigabytes, and we go for like one x uninstall rate. And if we go for less than a gigabyte, then there we're also near almost near two gigabyte two x uninstallation rate of of users of user applications. And well, the larger an APK is also the uh, install success rate is a lot lower, not just because of issues with the, with the network providers, but also with the user just saying, no, I don't want to install this right now, but I want to uh, do this. Uh, I want to, well, not install such a big application as well. So we did some research and we, just, we realized that uh, for about three megabytes of download size that you decrease, the installation size, uh, the installation success it increases by about 1%. Um, that is the um, very conservative estimate here. So for countries with low data um, availability or uh, low availability of, uh, of storage on device, this installation increase is a lot higher than just 1%. Um, so what did we actually do to make this better through app bundles? Uh, with a legacy APK shown on the left, we basically take everything that you package and give that to your user, no matter whether they need it, no matter whether they need the language or the CPU architecture or uh, the, the features or resources or anything. And with the dynamic delivery that we created through um, Android app bundles, all you have to, all we get to the, to the user is, in this case, the CPU architecture they need, the languages, and the resources that they need. Everything else is, well, not delivered to this user. And all you have to do to use this is, well, just create an app bundle and upload it to the Play Store rather than creating an APK and upload that. Um, so well, with, with all this, uh, with dynamic delivery, this would mean that no two users, if they use different devices or different configuration, would get the same set of information and the same set of resources and features on their device just by default. But they would get what they need. Another thing that we added is, on top of this, is dynamic feature delivery. So we talked about dynamic delivery. That is a thing that you get out of the box. Dynamic feature delivery means that you can take a feature of your application and put that into a separate module in Gradle speak. And um, then uh, this uh, can be downloaded later on, either through an API uh, or can be installed immediately, or even can be part of an instant app experience. We have seen with Android App Bundles over 500,000 applications in production, and about 35% of the active installations are um, from an Android App Bundle on the, on the Play Store. Nearly 50% of the top application and games have already migrated to Android App Bundles, and migrating over um, gives you a whooping downloading saving size of, of roughly 20% uh, or more in, uh, in many cases as well, uh, comparing it to a monolithic APK. Just to quickly wrap up, uh, we have modern Android development, which, well, on the one hand is Kotlin as a language, as in the pillar. We have tools, which is Android Studio. We have APIs, plenty of them, from the architecture components, Jetpack, constraint layout as a tool part, as part of the tooling as well, with the jumps back and forth between those pillars, um, and material design components, camera X, and things coming out on a, on a regular basis. And for distribution, we have the Android app bundle uh, with dynamic features, dynamic delivery, and the likes for you to make it easier to, to ship the app to a user, and that your user is very, a lot more likely to install the application on their devices. If you have more questions on this, if you have more uh, want to learn more about this, go to developersandroid.com, modern Android development, or, well, maybe you might have a question for me. And with that, thank you so much. Yay! It was awesome. Thank you, Ben. Thank you a lot for uh, sharing the knowledge. So uh, we have a couple of questions in the chat. Let me pick the first one. So uh, Andre is asking, uh, what about data binding? Is it still a recommended approach? Well, um, if you can use view binding instead of data binding, that's fine. Um, if you use data binding, you can. OK. Uh, someone is asking about where is the video of Android Studio shortcuts uh, you recommended? Um, there, there's a lot of them. Essentially, if you if you take a look uh, for Tornobi on uh, Google I.O. videos, 
Um, every every single of these videos is just a, um, a pure fountain of new shortcuts. Also, there's a couple of plugins for Android Studio that can show you if you, when you click around how you can do this in a keyboard shortcut instead of clicking. Um, that's part of the plugins. You basically go to the plugin store on on Android Studio, and um, well, then you can just download that and play around with it. I had it enabled for quite a while, and I learned a lot from the from the keyboard shortcuts there. Cool. Uh, another question: uh, What's the best technique to connect the web servers uh, to get JSON using Live Data and View Model? Because uh, Room just connects to SQLI database. What is the best technique to connect web services to get JSON using live data? Well, that, that's two different. Well, I wouldn't use live data to get the JSON from somewhere. Um, I would use maybe OK HTTP or the likes to do that in the background, um, and then use some of the adapters that are there for that. Um, there's uh, the architecture blueprint, blueprint samples on GitHub that you can take a look at for for doing stuff. Uh, also, well, not just in the in the um, in a very isolated fashion, but also throughout um, different issues that you might have like this. Um, there's a lot of samples on GitHub.com slash Android uh, where samples around for well, basically pretty much everything. If you want to take a look at, for example, Plaid is one of the applications that we wrote for this um, that you can take a look at for uh, for how we're doing things in like more and how we're recommending things for more. Um, in a wider fashion. Uh, also, the Sunflower application is definitely a very good point for you to get started with that as well. Cool. Um, the next question is uh, about the what's the future of uh, Kotlin multi-platform? What do you think about it? <laughs> what I think about Kotlin multi-platform? Um, well, I'm here to talk about Android. Um, I generally, I, we don't comment on future developments and things that might be happening in the future. And I am also not the right person to ask this because I haven't dabbled into it. I know that a lot of people are really excited about it. And a lot of people are seeing there's a lot of fun things coming up. And um, we just had a couple of videos in the Kotlin week of 11 weeks of Android. Um, so I definitely recommend watching these rather than asking me this question. I'm sorry. OK, this is the uh, toughest one. Um, so how fragment navigation supported in different models? Uh, and also, I will, I will add, what's the recommended way of uh, having different navigation graphs in uh, different models? Uh, you can use the dynamic feature navigator architecture component. Um, I'm very confident saying some things about that because I am one of the authors of the library. Um, so essentially, what you do is, you, well, there's multiple ways, as in many cases. Um, you can take a look at the sample, which is on GitHub. We create, uh, you can create your graphs either programmatically through a Kotlin DSL, or you can create your graphs in XML with, um, well, the, the files that we showed before. Um, with the navigation graphs. And um, then instead of using the navigation component, like the fragment navigation component, for example, or the runtime for, for activities, you just use the dynamic feature navigator um, components. And once you use these, um, you can get downloaded. You can download them, uh, download the modules when they are available. And we do a couple of, uh, well, it's not magic. You can look at all the code as well um, to how we basically inter inter intersect a program or we inject a progress fragment or prog progress destination that if a module isn't there, you basically just say, you navigate somewhere, module isn't there. We take care that it's there, that it's installed and available, and then afterwards navigate to your actual destination. The next time you navigate there, this intermediate step isn't necessary anymore. Cool. Um, may I ask if there is any code lab available for uh, seeing those kind of examples? Um, for the dynamic feature navigator, there is no code lab available at this moment. The navigation um, documentation is available for that, and there is the sample. Um, also, we gave a talk at Android Dev Summit, and I'm available on Twitter on all the questions they might have. Uh, also on the sample, uh, I'm on GitHub actively there as well, as well as on the issue tracker on any things that might be happening on navigation. If you find issues, please report them. We're actively listening to those, and also want to make sure that um, not just for navigation, but we prioritize. Um, the, the develop future development as we see issues arising. Cool. So I will pick the last two questions and uh, we'll move forward. Um, uh, is moving to our bundle instead of classic packaging means eliminating of the pirate uh, piratic APKs distribution? <laughs> um, so we, we've seen a couple of things there. So one of the things is. Um, uh, well, you have multiple AP APKs, and um, multiple APKs means that you have a base APK and you have APKs on top of that that are the configuration APKs. And um, we have heard from, from folks that are pirating APKs that this has become a lot more tricky. Um, but um, 
all of these things aside, it's always a game of cat and mouse. But I'm not a security expert either. Cool. Um, and the last question is, uh, do you know when the compatible releases for Kotlin and Firebase services will be available for Android Studio 4.1? Um, no, I do not. And I think there is a, a underlying issue um, that Louis wants to, wants to address here. Uh, I'm very happy to take this either on the chat and uh, also like talk about this on on Twitter because I well I haven't followed up what what the issue there is but um, if you encounter an issue with that then like I said just let's take this uh, on the chat for now and then maybe on Twitter later. Cool. Um, thank you a lot, Ben. So there is no crowd, but I will be your crowd and cheer. Thank you a lot for your time. <laughs> Woo! Thank you so much for having me. It was long overdue, and I'm very very happy that that you asked me to come. I very much enjoy this. Thanks. Cool. Um, so, and we are going to get our next speaker. Hi, Michael. Hi, guys. How are you doing? How are you oh, feeling? Oh, I'm OK. I'm, uh, I'm feeling good after a presentation of Ben. <laughs> it's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> Cool. Um, so before you start, you need to pick uh, what's your emoji uh, they describe you best and why. I like a shit, <laughs> but no, book, I don't. I, 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 yeah, I don't uh, be, uh, choose it. But um, I think uh, for my choice is it, uh, brain. Is a brain. Yeah, uh, I always uh, use it. Uh, especially for the uh, last two weeks <laughs> for uh, prepare this presentation. And I think it's uh, more uh, for more targeting for me. Yeah, emoji. Brain, guys. Yeah. Just a cool. second. I will share my presentation. Okay. And we're here. Um, okay. Tak. Uh, every, everyone. Uh, uh, see presentation yeah it's okay yeah yeah um so uh, again thank you ben uh we will leave a stage for the michael yeah. and thank you ben cool. looking forward to that thank you michael yeah see you man okay okay guys um Let's do it. Uh, my name is Michael Emilianov. I am work as a head of Android development at uh, CFT uh, company in the Russia, uh, in the Saint Petersburg. And uh, our, today our talk will be about one tap sign in. As a part of our conversation, we will discuss uh, motivation for improving sign in actions. Uh, take a look at uh, Google Identity Platform. Uh, take a look uh, on on top sign in feature itself uh, and its integration into app uh, briefly tell you what the block store will bring us and then move to summarize okay so motivation uh, modern signing into apps is simple for users isn't it we often need to enter username and password in our apps. And uh, more often it comes down to recovering or choosing a weak password, which is easy to remember. Also, usually authorization has a separate screen with its flow navigation, which interrupts user actions. Uh, and if device has changed, uh, then you need to sign in again everywhere. Ooh. But what if uh, we ask uh, the same question for developers? Often we need to develop our complex authentication system for our apps or support additional sign-in services. You also need to deal with the possible redirects to the login flow and don't forget about uh, security when saving or sending user credentials. Uh, in general, a lot of work needs to be done to make a simple user sign-in. Yeah, it's true, guys. But after receiving all these uh, kind of feedbacks, Android 11 introduced a new solution for uh, that simplifies authorization for users and its implementation for developers, and it's called one type sign in. What is what does it mean? Uh, how does one type improve the user experience uh, for sign in action? It doesn't interrupt UX flow if authorization is required. Inline integration in any app's UI. It's lightweight, UI dialog is independent of any screen. Uh, Sign-in flow is uh, now real simple. 
just one tab and you are in. And it's all based on the Google Identity Platform. In order to better understand uh, how one type works, you need to understand uh, what uh, Google Identity Platform and what services it has for interacting uh, with one tab. Let's see. Google Identity Platform is a set of services that provides APIs, tools uh, for creating authorization, secure storage credentials, and art of fill when you're uh, when you're in your apps. It includes uh, Google Sign In, uh, Smart Lock Storage, uh, After Fuel Framework, and uh, also Firebase authentications, SMS APIs. Uh, you might be using them already in your apps. And now there is a new feature, one tab. Uh, user credentials uh, and token ID uses for interact between these services. Uh, but for our topic, we uh, inter interest uh, three important uh, services. Uh, it's uh, Google Sign In, uh, Smart Lock, After Fill. For better understand how one top works, um, let's take a look uh, deeper on Google Sign In. It's important. Okay. Google Sign In allows the user to quickly enter to the app by using Google account. Uh, the service has been around for a long time uh, and we use it many well-known applications. It can be seen by well-known button uh, sign in with Google or continue with, with Google. But uh, uh, how Google Sign In it works? Uh, now let's look how uh, it works on the sequence diagram. Uh, First, uh, to start uh, Google Sign In, we need to uh, begin uh, for application to start uh, sign in call. After that, sign in UI will be appear for user. After Google handles the user authentication, session selection, and user consent, consent uh, when you tap on the, your Google account. After that, uh, the result will be an, uh, an access token. Okay. Uh, app should validate token before including it in Google API request, for example, to check expired days for it or for equals view for a Google account. And uh, if after su successful validation, uh, the application includes token to each call uh, Google API request. Uh, this sequence uh, diagram clearly shows how app and server relates through uh, through uh, Google sign in for getting authentication uh, token. Uh, also, it's same uh, for your backend server, uh, not only for Google servers. Uh, is uh, its flow same for all cases? Now we are ready to move uh, to code and. Uh, uh, see how Google Sign In integration. Google Sign In can be easily integrated into your application only five, uh, uh, only using five lines of code, and you are into it. Uh, first, you need to configure the behavior of a sign in request, uh, which um, uh, could contain email, uh, email address, uh, profile information, or user ID. Uh, for this example, we are using the default uh, configuration. Next step, uh, pass configuration object is an argument to get Google sign in client. Uh, when a client is received in any time, we can uh, get an intent from it, uh, which will be used to start an activity for result. Note that activity is used for Google sign in. Uh, the screenshot um, shows how sign in UI looks, uh, then we, we start the activity. Uh, here, you need to select your account uh, that will be used for sign in. After selecting an account, sign in request starts. And on activity result, we get back intent with sign in data from uh, get sign in account from intent method. Uh, we get si Google sign in account object. Uh, let's take a look uh, at this class. It's important. Uh, it contains all user credentials, email, name, photo, and Google ID token. Uh, it can use this information in your uh, app, uh, for example, to show user profile info as it looks, uh, it, as it looks uh, in the picture. Also necessary to say a few words about uh, the Google ID token. Uh, token is based on the OAuth 2.0 protocol, which allows you to securely access to many Google services. 
it's useful to remember some uh, rules for token refreshing used in validation. Uh, for example, token should be refreshed if you use sign, sign outs of your app. Token expired times shouldn't be more than 60 months. Also, if user has changed the password, uh, the token uh, needs to be refreshed, especially if uh, it's used for Gmail. And the maximum number of refreshes for one user uh, on per client, uh, no more than 50. A Google ID token uh, plays uh, an important role for using a Google Identity Platform service, and it's very convenient. Okay. To summarize, uh, Google Sign In has brought us convenient user authorization and this integration. We don't need to think about password. When, where is Google Sign In? One click, we are in. And this service has played the role of, for development of our services, uh, for example, after Phil Smart Log. Uh, you may ask, since the service allows you to perform a simple sign-in, why do you need one type then? In the fact, uh, like many services, Google Sign-in has uh, some uh, drawbacks. Uh, first, is it uh, is a redirect to third-party activity by using start activity for result. It complicates uh, flow navigation for developer and interrupts uh, the uh, action for, you, for, you, for the user. Uh, for example, we wanted to write a comment in some social service, but instead of that, sign-in screen appears. Secondly, sign-in is only for Google accounts. Uh, if you support our service, you need to show many buttons for authorization through uh, these uh, services. This is not the best uh, experience for our users. And in uh, some cases, if you sign in take uh, place for first time, you may need to redirect uh, password-based flow again. After all of it, one type should solve these problems and significantly improve the, the user uh, sign-in experience. And now let's take a look at it. So, one type sign-in. Uh, let's use an example that implements uh, the type feature. Uh, a link, for example, to it will be later. Uh, can you immediately notice where, where is uh, username, uh, password, where are username and password uh, for internet? Uh, the point is that uh, one type is talking based authorization. Uh, for username and password cases, uh, better use our Google identity platform services, uh, such as Afterfill or uh, Smart Log. During the own types, one tap sign in, user credentials are obtained directly from Google account. Uh, and as a result, you don't have to do anything at all. Just one tap and the data has received. As I said above, uh, for authorization by username password, one tap will not help you because uh, the token is missing. To improve uh, the user experience here, Google recommends using uh, smart lock and after fill. Uh, we will not dwell on integration of smart lock uh, or autofill in the application of, uh, in the VS presentation. It will take a longer time, but uh, uh, the integration of itself doesn't take longer. Most important to understand where to use them. Uh, smart lock uh, provides a secure storage uh, for password where you can store it after authorization. And after fill lets you share credentials across all platforms. You may use uh, this service uh, with one type in one application, especially if you have password-based flow. Okay, back to one tap. As I said, you don't need password-based logic for it. One tap is ready for integration. First, if you have an existing Google sign-in or want uh, to implement sign-in experience for your app, you don't need to use old Google sign-in for it. One question uh, is uh, one type sign in or sign up and uh, what is the difference? Uh, uh, just imagine, imagine uh, the situation you are working with application in which you have already be authorized and you use uh, its feature and everything is in order. But it's time to reauthorize. Let's say to update at least token. In this case, why would you suggest going through the entire flow authorization cycle? It's enough to suggest and continue to use this account. This is how sign-in works for already authorized users in your app. Otherwise, if you already have accounts and you want to sign in in the new application, 
uh, if one types an in authorization support where when you don't need to go to go to registration form it's enough to show one type dialect and select uh, the required account this is how sign up works for all available users for authorization in your app it's simple since uh, sign in and sign up complement each other this should be taken into account in development let's take a look uh, at example first uh, you need to create a one type of request for sign in uh, this mode is set uh, through the set filter buffertization accounts method during request configuration we pass two argument to it for sign in okay next uh, we run a sign in request and one type sign in UI dialog will show. If you get an error uh, when we try uh, to flow, uh, when we try to flow sign up. For that, we need to make a request uh, with set filter authorization accounts bypass argument false again. And uh, then we run sign in request with this configuration. And one type sign in up dialog will show. Uh, both flows, as you saw, shows uh, one, type, uh, one type of dialog at, at the time. You don't need uh, two type dialog at the one time. If you get an, an error uh, here on the one uh, sign in up flow, uh, when we move user to user uh, name password flow, it's a better experience uh, for us. Uh, okay, why is necessary to create a, rec uh, a request for each cases? I, am exp I will explain. It's simple. Because begin uh, sign-in request uh, type for one type uh, creates a through the through builder and the result object will be always immutable. Uh, we cannot to pass any arg argument uh, to it. Okay, now let's take a closer look as an integration of one tap into application. Uh, for this, I will use my sample because there is no code labs yet and you can uh, redirect to URL uh, which will yeah, I pass on the presentation. Okay. And so the whole one tap integration will consist of seven steps. And, fifth, and the first step is uh, to create a client ID. Uh, sometimes it's a uh, too difficult uh, step for many developers. <laughs> okay, if you already have uh, Google sign in in your application, then you already have a client ID and uh, you can skip this step. Otherwise, do a few steps. Now go to uh, Google APIs uh, page uh, on, of your project, uh, select uh, the credential section. On credential page, uh, click button uh, create, create credentials. You will see pop-up menu, uh, select OAuth client, uh, client ID from, from the menu. Then uh, cl click on the application type pop-up menu and select the type web application. This client type ne necessary for calling Google services, uh, from Google services from app, server or web. Of, uh, Android type need only from a server side, but will not be used it for sample. After you choose a web application type, just create a client ID with default uh, default parameters. Uh, that's all. Now we have created a client ID, which will be used for sending one type sign-in request. Move on. The next step is uh, added uh, dependencies. Everything is simple here. In the app model in build Gradle file, connect uh, just uh, added uh, the play service of dependencies. That's all. Uh, third step after you can already go to the code itself and next uh, we, I will show how to create sign-in client. Sign-in client is an object uh, through uh, which uh, will, will be used uh, for sign-in request. We receive uh, it from identity API, it's a new API guys, uh, passing a link to the activity. After creating uh, the client, uh, let's configure it. it. Same it's for Google sign -in. To configure a sign-in client, we need several builders for customized sign-in behavior for. First, uh, when using a password-based flow and when using ID, to ID token. Uh, we need to be begin sign-in request builder, which will create a request co configuration object for sign-in. 
Second, if you use password-based authentication, uh, when you need to call set password request options. But uh, for, my, for my sample and for my case, it uh, didn't work for me. Uh, next builder turn on Google ID token behavior, and it's our case. Uh, we need uh, two methods here. Uh, set server client ID, uh, require si server client ID from Google APIs, uh, which we has created on the Google APIs page. And uh, set filter by authorization authorized accounts, uh, which toggle sign in or sign up flow. You saw this method uh, when I talk about uh, the difference uh, between sign in and sign up. After all this configuration, uh, here how does sign in request look? Yeah, too much builders, but it's simple. Uh, we are now ready to display the one tap uh, dialog. Uh, for it, uh, we need to call one type of client begin sign method and pass uh, the sign request uh, here, which we has configured before. One tap client uh, will call uh, the uh, success listener uh, if uh, the user has any uh, saved credentials for your app. After which, you need to uh, send a pending intent uh, through uh, start intent sender for result. And one tap dialog, dialog will show. If credentials didn't find for your app, uh, one tap um, client will call fail recently. In that case, you could start sign up flow. So uh, we shown one tap UI where user selected an account. How can we get this data now? Just like with Google sign in, in on activity for result. And in the same way, uh, through one tap client, client uh, we've called get sign, in, sign, get sign in credential method. And after we get user credential from intent okay but signing credential uh, type uh, is uh, another type uh, as uh, it was uh, on uh, signing uh, google signing uh, case uh, so we receive signing credential object which contains all necessary user credentials your name email and even password may come you can see on the right screen how credentials are used to show user info also, we have Google ID token in there, and now we can use this token in the further requests. If um, we got a password, uh, it's better to save it via smart lock. We may put our credentials into a field, after which the user will get our own credentials uh, when reauthorization happens. Cool. And in the last step, let's look how to handle errors. Uh, Errors are handled with uh, try catch for get sign in credentials from intent method. We can get uh, type of error by status code. Pay attention to, uh, to the cancel type. If user declined uh, to sign in uh, uh, the call to sign in in credential from intent, we'll throw an uh, API exception with a common status code canceled. If user cancels several sign-in prompts in a row, the one-type client will not prompt the user for the next uh, 24 hours. In other words, uh, you will get a uh, ban for sign-in. Yeah, you can see that on the right screen. Uh, better flow uh, don't let user report sign-in when cancelled came out. It's, uh, it's better to redirect user to password-based uh, flow. If you got a ban, for example, like me, while testing, uh, then it can be removed by clearing storage of, of play services. Okay, so we discovered uh, the integration of one tab. Now let's move to another interesting feature called the Block Store. Block Store is a new API which allows you to save uh, a token in the cloud so that you can reuse it later. For example, when you enter to application on your new device. Uh, since Black Store is active development, testing, uh, uh, but it's already known will soon replace after fill smart lock services. Uh, we don't have uh, open API until uh, before release. Okay. 
After that, you will now need to save password and user credentials only the token uh, uh, with Blockstore. Uh, Blockstore will be end-to-end -end encrypted credential storage solution. It's a good alternative to password manager and fully integrated with on-type sign-in. Perhaps uh, after the release of Android 11, we will find out more details about its work. And I will explain you about its work. Okay, well, uh, time to take conclusions. Uh, one type sign in will improve sign in user experience in the apps which use Google account. Uh, it turns authorization into simple actions. Uh, just one tap and you are in without being interrupted by sign up screen. Eliminates no need to enter username and password. Also, it's a part of Google Identity Platform and integrates with other major services. And Block Store will provide the ability to securely save and share type token among new devices. Now you can use one type sign in and sign up in your apps. It's really a cool uh, feature in Android 11. Thank you for listening to me. I hope it was useful for you and interesting. And here's some helpful links I used and I am ready for questions. Yay, thank you, thank you a lot. So uh, we have a couple questions. Uh, uh, the first one, uh, will one type uh, one tap sign in work if user has opt for double factor identification to to FA. Uh, you can use one tap sign in if you have already double factor authorization. After you will be uh, created token, one type sign in only need uh, uh, token for sign in. If you have it, uh, then it will be easily 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 used. If you don't have, you uh, you can use uh, your double factor authorization, and after that, uh, for reauthorization users in your app, use one type sign in feature. Yeah. Cool. Um, another question: Is it possible to authorize uh, with one type sign in uh, using Facebook or Apple credentials? Uh, I don't. I didn't test uh, this uh, feature because. Uh, one type sign in uh, only work with uh, Google accounts, but uh, in progress in uh, in the future developments, it seems uh, one tap will be uh, soon support and other uh, accounts uh, which you plug in your device. But if you use uh, or or uh, same uh, um, authorization uh, by all protocol. I think you can generate a token and pass uh, to sign in client in the same. And I think uh, will tap one tap will uh, work uh, same on this. But I don't. Uh, I didn't test. Cool. Um, so that's it for now. Thank you a lot, Michael. So let's bring here. Thank you, guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Pavel. Yeah. Pavel. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me well? Everything's fine. Yeah, fine. yes, yes, yes. So, uh, before we start to talk about bubbles, notifications, shortcuts, yeah. uh, icebreaker. Yeah. So, we need to pick an uh, emoji that best describes you and uh, uh, explain us why. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that I was thinking about which one to choose, and uh, I stopped on the emoji that is like a crazy hat, you know, because today it's a crazy day. It's uh, lots of things, lots of insights, and uh, we are doing a very fantastic job here today together. So I think it's uh, best will describe me this emoji. I don't know. I don't see here on these emojis, but I think that you understand what I mean. Yeah. Yeah, like oh. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like this. Yeah, right. <laughs> cool. Um, you need to share a presentation. Yeah, sure. Let me let me share my presentation. Okay, okay, okay. So yeah, can you can you see? Yeah, we're good to go. Oh. Uh, okay, now it's my time. Yeah, <laughs> the last one. Okay. So enjoy. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jonathan. Okay, hello everyone. Let me introduce, let me say some words about myself. So my name is Pavel Shigelsky and I work as an Android developer in a product company based in Minsk in Belarus. It's called Flow Health. 
it's a platform for women. Uh, we help uh, women to take care of their body, to listen to their health and everything. So, yeah, uh, you can find me. I attach different links uh, uh, how you can find me in the Twitter or Facebook. It doesn't matter. So you can find me everywhere. And But I don't want to talk about me, uh, myself today. I just I will tell you my story. Uh, my story begins when I was a kid and uh, uh, I, I wanted to have a, a dog. I want to have a pet, but my parents uh, didn't buy me, and they because there were several reasons why they couldn't buy me a dog. And I grew up; I still don't have a dog. <laughs> so I decided to write an application. Uh, like today, it's uh, every, everything goes online, and I decided to write an application where I can communicate with my with my dog. So uh, the, the, the application is quite simple. So I have a kind of uh, the, the main screen where uh, I have a, my virtual friend, my, my dog. Uh, it's a list. Uh, uh, pressing on the list item, I will go, I will open another screen where I can, it's a chat screen where I can communicate with my, with my dog, with my virtual friend. I can send a message. I can type her a message and send it. And later, uh, my friend will, will uh, respond me will reply so uh, yeah it's quite simple quite, quite nice what uh, what are the main structures uh, of my application basically every, uh, everything is uh, concentrated in the in the class which called chat and uh, the the main the main uh, property here is uh, of the of this object is contact contact represents uh, something that is necessary to to understand with whom i'm talking so maybe later i will add other other virtual friends like maybe for example cat or or parrot or, or sheep or any other friends so the the contact basically it's a, it's a class which describes the main attributes of, of of my friend so it's ad id identificator name and icon later i decided to create a list a list i created a list because yeah you know maybe later i will decide another uh, to add an other friends so yeah self explain uh, self self explanatory uh, list okay so but there is a problem i, I mean that for example uh, i i open the chat screen and i want to 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 write a message to my dog and i don't want to sit uh, to, uh, to be in the application for a long time like I don't want to uh, sit and wait while my my dog will respond me right so it can be maybe in 30 seconds it can be in a minute or it, it, it doesn't matter I, I don't know when it when it replies okay so for example in 30 minutes so and i, I don't want to to be in the in the in the application and waiting for the dog so what we can what we can do of course i want to be notified right so in the android framework we have a good a tooling for that we have a good uh, uh, tool called Not notification manager, which can uh, notify me about the uh, new message which uh, which arrives. Right. So first of all, we have to create a, a channel channel for the for the for our notifications. So let's create a channel, and, and uh, I will put a importance high for the channel because I want to be to be notified and see the notification straight away when the message arrives. So I I want to to respond uh, my my virtual friend. So that's fine. Okay, so we built a notification channel. Let's go and build a notification, right? So I have a method called show notification uh, where uh, where the argument is uh, our chat. So um, later I decided to to uh created my own uh uh d decided to create another properties like icon and content uri icon is something that will be um uh, re representative of my uh contact and the content uri is uh, the like it's it's a data that will be used later i will show you how but uh, generally i put all the information that is related to the chat and uh, i mean the content id contact id so and I will create a person, person that will represent my my contact, that will represent my dog, right? So and put put all the necessary information in order to create a person. And so we good to go. So we start to build an notification. Everything starts with a builder, right? In the in the in Android, everything starts with a builder. So I put the context, I put the, the 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 name of my channel, and I pass the required information uh, in order to build the notification. So I pass uh, all the required uh, things like title, category, person, and so on. Uh, 
And uh, of course, I want to, uh, when I see the notification, I want to open the, the application, I want to open the chat screen and uh, start uh, chatting with my friend, right? So I put uh, the content, uh, the pending intent, uh, which will lead to directly to, to the screen. And one more thing that I want to add is uh, a quick reply action that can be used later in order to, for example, if I want to reply directly from the notification, no, why not, right? So, uh, yeah, all these are uh, uh, packed together. So now I can uh, notify our notification manager when, uh, when a new message arrives, I will notify our notification manager, I will see the notification, right? So everything works fine. So for example, let's go back to our application. I'm in the application. I send some uh, some message to, to my friend and I go uh, put the application to the background and waiting for, for, for a new message. I can do, I can, I can surf internet and everything. So it doesn't matter, right? So, and the, the next thing then, uh, after a while, maybe 30 seconds or something, my doc responds me. So yeah, I see it's quite, Simple message, right? Quite simple message. If I open Notification Manager, I will see this simple message with those attributes that I passed to the to, to the builder. Yeah, but it's still quite boring because you know my notification can go down if I do not respond immediately or didn't see it or something. So it's quite boring. But there is a solution. Android 11 presents a new way how we can communicate with others. So there is, a, there is like uh, the focus, one of the focuses of the team was uh, people and identity. So the Android team uh, gathered, uh, collected a lot of feedback from people. Uh, how do they understand the notifications? How do they behave? How do they communicate in different chat messengers and so on and so forth? So they bring us something new that can uh, that can that we can use as a user users and uh, can benefit from it, out of it. Okay, Android 11, yeah, Android 11 brings us a new section called conversations, uh, which, which should uh, prioritize our notifications and we should uh, see uh, that that is always on top of the notification manager and we'll see all our important notifications straight away. So let's, let's go and deep, uh, deep dive into this section. So on, on the top, you will see this section header, which is uh, called conversation. And um, then we can see the, the count, the number, the number which uh, tells us how many messages we've missed for a particular conversation. And um, we can see also uh, who sends us this notification and uh, all this uh, uh, chat history. And uh, of course, we can notice this big, big arrow, which uh, tells us that this notification can be collapsed and expanded. So it, in, in this case, it will change its state. And of course, uh, big, big uh, avatars that uh, captivate, right? How can we build this? Uh, how can we go and build that our notification will appear in this uh, conversation section? The first thing we can do is we have to apply the message messaging style to our notification. How we can do this? Basically, the messaging style was previously added, so it was a long time ago, and maybe you already used it uh, for uh, for customizing your uh, notification. Uh, but yeah, so but right now it's a, a necessary thing that you need to do in order to be in this uh, conversation section. So I will build a user. User, it's like me. It means that uh, if the message is mine, so I want to to see. Uh, 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 name of uh, of, uh, of the author of this message, right? So it's me. So I pass it to the message style, and then I want to customize a bit our messages so they will look more fancy, more more beautiful. So I uh, customize all the messages based on the uh, whether it's uh, uh, incoming or it's my message. So I can I can do some styling here, and uh, yeah, those messages I will prioritize based on the uh, uh, based on the timestamp of the of the of each message. So if we run this code on the Android 10 and Android 11, basically you won't find any differences with the, when the notification arrives. So there is no difference at all. But if we open the application or, or notification manager, we can spot some differences. First of all, we will spot this uh, tiny thing that is like a big arrow. Big arrow tells you that you can 
uh, expand or collapse the notification. But what, what more we can see here is that all the notifications are split into sections and our notification still in the notification section. Why not? Why, why it's not in the conversation section? I'm asking myself and like, there is something I need to add as well. Yeah, and definitely. In Android 11, in order to appear in this conversation section, you need, uh, you need to apply a message style. And additionally, you have to refer to a valid long-lived conversation shortcuts, right? Okay, let me remind you what what is it a shortcut? A shortcut is, is something um, uh, it's a, it's something that helps you to show the user additional like some part of the functionality that will navigate directly to your application. The so the shortcuts can be different. There are like three types of shortcuts: static and dynamic. So you can static you can define shortcut that in the Android manifest and dynamic, the, uh, the one that you add prom programmatically. And when you long press on your application, you will see such a pop-up where it will be listed all the dynamic and uh, static shortcuts. Basically, the, um, the number of such shortcuts are limited. Basically, it's uh, four or five based on the, uh, on the Android manufacturer. And a uh, pin shortcut, when you uh, try to move uh, uh, one of the shortcuts from this pop-up on the left, uh, and put it on the on the launcher. So next time when you want to open the chat with with the dog, if I want if I'd like to open the chat with the dog, I just press the button on or press the shortcut uh, with uh, dog icon, and I will go directly to the chat with uh, my my dog. Okay, so yeah, we are good to go. So we have to uh, add a shortcut, right? So how we can do it? First of all, we need to define a shortcut ID, which uh, will be a concatenation. In my case, it will be a concatenation between uh, con uh, contact uh, um, string with uh, ID. Uh, shortcut ID as ID, it should it's, it's an identificator, so so it should be unique, right? So okay, we define it. Okay, let's go. Let's go and build a shortcut for each of my contacts. Like in my case, it's uh, one 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 contact, but maybe later I will add more, and so we can map and build the shortcuts. So let's build it. First of all, we should uh, should create a builder. Again, builder. <laughs> Everything is builder. Okay. So we pass a context, we pass a shortcut ID, everything seems good, right? So next I will pass all the required information. In our case, uh, the set activity, uh, uh, it means that for dynamic shortcuts, we have to target uh, our key activity. A, short, a shortcut will be shown along with these activity icons on the launcher as I, as I show you before. And, um, and a label and icon, everything will be uh, so the shortcut will have its own icon and uh, its own label. Okay, and I will pass the intent. Intent is something that when I press a shortcut, uh, I will go directly to to to, to this uh, to this screen. So in my case, I want to go, go directly to my chat screen. So the main activity where I will switch fragments and go directly to the chat with my contact. Okay, and the last thing, uh, I, I want to pass a person. The person is basically is uh, something that you uh, that you help Android system to understand better how you um, how you use the application, and it will try to provide you better suggestions in the chooser dialog. So, but. It's not all because we built a just a shortcut, but remember the word long leaf shortcut. So we have to build a long leaf shortcut. We have to set the, um, we, sh we should call set long leaf uh, method and pass it through. Basically, uh, when I started digging into this long leaf uh, uh, attribute, I did not find much information about that. Basically, I started like thinking and ask and asked Dan from uh, Android team, UI team, what does it mean? Why it's neat? So there is a thread, so you can later uh, read it in, in, in my Twitter. But in general, in in a short, if I uh, the, the it means that the intent will be stable, so the system will later cache this intent and so you later can open the shortcut by this intent so this is a required field and the last thing again the last thing right so um this is not kind of um, a required thing but uh, as i understood it's very it's very important for the uh, uh, android uh, framework uh, it's a locus id 
this is uh, this is id that is um, used uh, for 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 the framework in order to rank your conversations based on your app usage later i don't know right like right now the android 11 uh, the sources of android 11 is not released yet so i'm not sure how it used across the system but i hope that later when they released it i will go and look uh, look into it and try to find the answer but right now i can only uh, see the, the 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 description of this uh, local city so yeah and uh, the 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 part uh, we need to pass here the identificator so we create a local id uh, class uh, that will um, uh, that will take the shortcut id and the same thing we have to pass to notification uh, to our notification when we build it and the same thing we need to pass to the uh, activity which is served uh, as a chat for for in my case so there is like several places where we need to propagate this locus id okay so yeah we built our shortcut that's that's enough that's enough for now so we need this to add these shortcuts to our shortcut manager. Okay, let's do it. Uh, um, uh, shortcut manager, it's, uh, it's a service that helps to, to build short, to, to add shortcuts. So there's an API called add dynamic shortcuts. So we can part the list of our shortcuts and okay, good to go. Uh, but yeah, there is always a trick. There is always some details. You have to you have to think that now when you uh, th there can be a case when you will receive in the if you uh, use this API you can receive a legal argument exception because there is a bunch of uh, there is a, a limitation on how many shortcuts can be added for uh, per activity so uh, usually people write such uh, code in order to understand and how many um, shortcuts can be used per activity. So they take the list and then based on this number, uh, it can be different, absolutely. Uh, they can uh, split uh, or recite the, 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 the list. But from uh, starting from Android 11, you don't need it. So there is, all, there is already a new API called push dynamic shortcut that can uh, give you the possibility to add a shortcut without worrying about this uh, exception. So they, they do it uh, uh, based on your uh, what you're uh, uh, passing. Okay, yeah. So we build shortcuts, we add shortcuts. Now we have to somehow to yeah to to link it with uh, our notification. So every time when we receive a notification, we can do update our shortcuts, but it's not necessary. I just do it in a, in a, as an example. So and. This is very important uh, that we uh, take the shortcut and link it to the uh, to the notification. So the next time when I will receive a notification from my pet friend, from my virtual friend, from my dog, I will see definitely that my notification already put in the, into this section. So the section appears, and the. The funny thing that if we run the same code on Android 10 and Android 11, basically we will see like there is like a difference between notifications, right? So there is like uh, a small uh, an icon, uh, an icon uh, is a bit different, and the uh, layout of different buttons and uh, on, and uh, suggestions are also a bit different. So yeah, that's it. But again, but <laughs> so many buts, right? Uh, but for me, it's a problem, you know. For example, uh, like okay, I can use shortcut. I can I can uh, create a shortcut um, shortcut and directly go to my uh, to my chat with my friend. But it's not very convenient, right? So I will receive a notification. I will like I I, sh I, I can do lots of different uh, tabs. But in in case if for example there is a different chat messengers for example like i have two conversation applications where i chat with different pets in each of them i'll need to switch between different apps so it's not very convenient right right so yeah like, like and in android 11 we have a solution we have a solution it's called bubbles api basically bubbles api was introduced a long time ago it was uh, introduced not long time ago, but maybe a year ago, right? In 2019, uh, but it was not uh, released. It was not released. I will tell you why. But before that, I, I want to emphasize what is Bubble. 
Now, what is Bubble? Uh, Bubble is a platform API that provides a way to publish a content. It's a kind of a floating point, uh, floating circle on top of everything. And it's uh, a good alternative to using system alert window, which is usually, it's, kind of, it's a permission, which is usually used for uh, in different applications, scam applications that can bring uh, damage to, to the user experience. But uh, again, again, but <laughs> I don't know how many uh, how many times I will tell but, but yeah, this is uh, the problem. Maybe I'll need to find another uh, word for that. Okay, and the the only caution here that uh, Android team is trying to, uh, to 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 tell everyone who is using bubbles is that you don't need to bake the, the whole application of uh, the the whole functionality of your application into the bubble. So it should not. Uh, navigate directly to your uh, application. It should contain just a small portion of your uh, application that you want to present to the user, like a chat messenger, like uh, your chat, uh, like a chat with somebody, and so on. Uh, this kind of uh, functionality was presented a long time ago uh, 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 by Facebook. It was introduced by Facebook a long time ago, since 2013. Right now, it's 2020, like seven years. Somebody say somebody thinks that Google is a kind of a, um, uh, slow here, but I think that uh, I think that uh, Google is doing a very great job here because they unify the way how we can use uh, bubbles. Because uh, the solution from Facebook is kind of a, not a hack, but it's their own solution, which uh, like a service and uh, this permission and so on and so forth. So Google tries to move away from this uh, uh, permission and try to make it more stable and unified for all of us. So how can we add bubble? First of all, we need to define an activity that will represent this bubble. So we have to add into the Android manifest, we have to add the bubble activity, but with some very required attributes. The first one is allow embedded. This is um, an attribute that tells that the expanded bubble is embedded in the system UI. The second one is document launch mode. In my case, it's always. So uh, the document launch mode means that there will be multiple instances of this activity. So in, in case if I pass always. So in, if you look at the example, if you look on, on the picture, you will see that like there is two conversations opened, like a bubble opened, uh, my, my dog conversation and my cat conversation. So each of them are separate activities. So if, for example, if I execute uh, ADB down SUS or, and I will see like, several records for, for, for those activities. And all of them, uh, like bubble activity, will be marked as uh, multi-window. Okay, uh, there, there are a bunch of values for this document launch mode, basically. So they are very documented. Uh, so you don't need, like, please uh, read the documentation in case if you want to uh, pass uh, uh, any different value. So, yeah. Okay, uh, and the third thing, the third thing that we need to add uh, in order to, to use bubble. So we have to pro uh, say that this activity is resizable. So it means that expanded bubble is resized by the system UI. By default, starting from Android 24, it's a, it's a, uh, the, the default value, the default value for uh, this attribute uh, starting from uh, Android API 24, it's a true. But I recommend you always to define uh, you know, to define this attribute and define the value in order to that other your uh, your colleagues uh, or your comrades uh, developers will understand that it's an important thing here. And I will add some small details, like I will add a small data uh, like a data that uh, I want to pass to my uh, bubble activity in order to reuse the fragment that I have already for which represents the chat uh, chat screen so if you look in the into the bubble uh, like look at um, take uh, try to uh, analyze the anatomy of the bubble uh, yeah it's uh, the entry point is activity but um, in any case in inside of this activity you can use fragment or in my case i just reuse the chat fragment or you can use a custom view it doesn't matter so the entry point always activity but later you can use whatever you you want okay so we define the activity and next we want to we have to build the intent the pending intent for for in order to go to open this bubble activity and and again 
<laughs> everything starts with a builder, so we can build bubble. Everything starts with a builder, we pass the shortcut ID in order to uh, link our notification and shortcut with a bubble. And we pass the intent and uh, we pass the icon for, for, for our bubble and we pass the, uh, the desired height. So it means that the, um, the, 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 that is uh, our, uh, our bubble will be uh, this size. Okay, uh, so we build the uh, metadata. So we can uh, uh, we, we can insert pass this met metadata to our notification. We are this method set bubble metadata. Okay, let's try it in production. I think that you uh, you might see you might uh, notice this image and think that something wrong will, will happen, right? Yeah, that's true. We will crash. We will crash and. Um, there is a kind of uh, the crash is quite uh, uh, understandable. It's self-explanatory, so we can uh, understand why it's happening. I'm like there is a bunch of different builders, constructors of a builder in uh, for a bubble, and none of them uh, doesn't work well. So uh, the only one which is working is uh, this one that is uh, typed here in the in the description of the exception. Uh, I don't know exactly why, again, because the, uh, the sources are not released. Maybe later I will understand what um, kind of uh, uh, mixtures uh, I should use in order to, to, to pass uh, uh, the, the, in, uh, the shortcut ID into the constructor of the builder. But yeah, let's, let's, let's try. So the try number two, I will pass the intent and pass the icon to the builder and we'll see how it goes. Uh, yeah. I run the application and almost everything works. So I see my uh, on the on the left I'll see my notification and I see on the right I'll see already an expanded bubble. So this is bu open bubble activity. If I press there is if you notice there is in the notification there is a small detail uh, it's a, it's an icon which leads directly to the bubble to the expandable bubble. So if I press it I will open this bubble. Um, if I open the notification manager, I again can see uh, this. Uh, if I expand the notification, I will again see this uh, button here as well. So this button has a state. So every time when you press, you will see how the image is changing. And the last thing, when I, for example, if I already opened the bubble, uh, this floating point, this floating window will be on top of the launcher, on top of all of the windows. So every time when you press on this floating window, you will open the, the bubble. On the lock screen, when you, for example, do not have anything and uh, you receive a notification, you will see this uh, notification and you swipe down, you will see the expanded uh, notification. Okay, I will drink some water. Uh, it's too hot. <laughs> okay, and uh, so uh, the, we already built a um, uh, um, bubble metadata, but uh, there is uh, some uh, useful setters, some useful properties that I want to emphasize. Uh, the first one is uh, after expandable. Uh, it means that every time when you receive a notification which is already bubbled, I mean, you have a bubble on, on top of the screen, and when you receive a notification, it will be automatically expanded. So you will see the expanded uh, uh, bubble. Uh, the second one is a suppressed notification, which is quite interesting um, uh, for me. Like, for example, you have a bubble and you have uh, your application, which is in foreground, right, for you. So every time when you receive a notification, uh, or like the, a new message arrives from my from my my virtual friend, I won't see any notifications in the status bar and I, in notification manager, and I won't see any indicator on the bubble. So I won't see any, like, I won't, I won't uh, see any uh, uh, notification that uh, a new message arrived. But if I put my application into the uh, background, uh, next time when I receive a notification, I will definitely receive, a, see the notification in the notification manager, and I will see the indicator on the, on the bubble. Uh, I was talking more about the Android 11, but let's get back to Android 10, right? Because the uh, bubbles were introduced in Android 10. And if we try the same code, try to launch the same code uh, on the on the uh, Android, uh, Android 10, we won't see any button in the notification. So how, how can we test bubbles on Android 10? And if you look around, you can go directly to the developers options, you will find this uh, section, new section called bubbles, which is uh, turned off by default. Uh, by default. 
But if you turn it on, the next time when you receive a notification, you will uh, immediately see the, the bubble uh, on, on top of, uh, you will see, uh, immediately will see the, this bubble. And you can tap it, so it will open the activity and everything. Why it was not released in Android 10? I was asking myself, and I go directly to the Android Backstage podcast. It was an episode about bubbles and conversations. And the Android team that is uh, that were releasing uh, that is um, uh, releasing the Android uh, bubbles in the Android, they said that the, the the for them the most important thing is they do not know exactly how to integrate bubbles in the, into the system, into the framework. So every part of the framework knows about bubbles and everybody use it in the right way. Because, you know, uh, right now there is like a big challenge for Google to understand how they can, um, how, uh, how, uh, which app should use bubbles. Like for, for now, there is like a big guideline for, uh, in, on, the, on the developer side where it stated that uh, only chat messages or similar things should use bubbles or for, for, for communication, for uh, conversation and else. But, but we'll see, we'll see how it works, right? And of course, fix bugs, fix some bugs. I talked much about the bubble activity and I think that uh, uh, every Android developer, when uh, he, when he, when uh, when he hears about uh, activity, the first thing that pops in, in into his mind is that lifecycle, right? So, what is lifecycle of the bubble activity? Basically, it's the same lifecycle as an uh, ordinary activity. So, it goes from on create to on start to on resume and on post resume. So, none of the uh, special uh, life cycle callbacks or, or life cycle events or past, uh, will be called. And the same when you close the bubble, when you tap, or when you close the bubble, you will go through on pause, on stop, on save instant state. And if you, for example, want to remove the bubble from the launcher screen, so you have to long press on the bubble and you will see this uh, kind of a new uh, cross, uh, like a, a cross, uh, cross uh, circle where you can put this bubble and uh, when you release the, uh, release your finger you will receive uh, on destroy in the bubble activity uh, yeah that's it but uh, what about the process that uh, for example when the application when our Android framework decides to kill our uh, our process so we will receive kind of it, it want to reclaim some memory, so we will receive a two memory callback. And in this case, uh, the process will be dead and our bubble as well. So yeah, so this is like it. And uh, the last thing that is also interesting is to see how the uh, uh, how how the life cycle of the activity which is uh, behind the bubble. What is uh, what is uh, what life cycle? What would be a life cycle in, in, uh, for for that particular activity? So, for example, we have a chat uh, chat screen, and uh, it passes through all the normal life cycle, right? And I press like a menu button, which uh, can create me a bubble and show it and like expand it automatically. So the bubble will go through the uh, again through the normal life cycle events into to post resume, and and that's it. So the behind uh, the, so the activity which is behind of the bubbles it will be in the same state so it won't receive any kind of pause or something like that or stop or whatever so it will be in the same in the same state great a great uh, bubble looks very interesting yeah but there is some limitations there is some limitation so I decided to check which limitation bubble have has so I created like uh, again I put I, I, um, Open the same application, and I uh, decided to uh, populate my contact list with a number of uh, different virtual friends, and start conversation with all of them, all of them. So I'll receive a message from all my friends, and you know the funny thing that they all uh, uh, they all grouped in one bubble on the screen. So when I tap on this bubble, I will see definitely all the uh, conversation that they have with uh, with my friends. So and like and you see there's like a limited limited um, uh, space for those uh, conversations so that uh, they will be prioritized based on the latest uh, message that is received from this in, in this conversation but if i open the chat uh, or notification manager i will see all the notification from all my uh, conversation so they won't be such group okay i talked uh, about the um, conversation but maybe you noticed there is a plus 
Plus, when you open uh, open bubble or open this kind of floating point uh, point, so we we'll, like uh, um, notice this plus uh, circle. What did what does it mean? For example, I have uh, two conversations, and one conversation I decided to remove. So I'll just delete this bubble and uh, switch to my second conversation with my cat. And next time when I want to restore, I go just directly to this plus sign, and I will see this. Uh, deleted conversation so I can restore it easily. So I can put, uh, click, uh, uh, click on it and it will be restored at automatically. I started my problem, remember I was starting my problem of uh, when I switched from the shortcuts to, to the bubble, uh, asking uh, how can we um, manage when we have different applications uh, and start typing in different applications. So for example, I have a, uh, one application, uh, one uh, where I can chat with different uh, friends and I have another application where I can uh, start conversation with other friends. And I like, I started sending a message uh, in both applications. And they, and as you see, uh, all of the conversations are also grouped in this uh, floating point. So if I open this floating point and I see that, yeah, definitely I have different conversations with different people uh, grouped in this bubble. So I changed icons so we can easily distinguish between uh, different conversation applications. And, uh, and uh, for example, if uh, the, my dog send me a message, it will be the first in, the, in this list. So, so it will be prioritized. I, I decided to check how how Facebook works because it was introduced to a long time ago. How how do the Facebook work? So, um, for example, I do not have any conversations, and later I received several messages from my friends in Facebook Messenger. And I, if I open this floating window, I will see that on top there is a number of my conversations that are active right now. So it works sim in similar way. And what I uh, what I know so far is that. Facebook and other applications uh, that uh, that uh, provides the chat as chat messenger and everything. So they are going to migrate their code to this bubble API because uh, yeah, it's unified API, which is quite nice and why not? But uh, <laughs> again, but sorry. <laughs> okay, uh, so uh, at the end, I want to talk a bit about the notifications. Yeah, there is like, always notifications, notifications, every, everywhere notifications. And I have a question to, to my audience. Do you use uh, Do Not Disturb mode on your phone? And how many years ago did you try it? And uh, do you use it on a, like, on a daily basis? You can answer in a, with, like, with a number, how many years do, do you use? Or um, you can like, uh, say plus that uh, I used it a lot and so on. Um, the funny thing that I found a small, um, a small Twitter, uh, uh, several tweets uh, from Heidi and Jake, uh, where they described the way how they use uh, how they use how they use this uh, do not disturb mode, and it appeared that um, a lot of people are uh, using do not disturb mode like almost forever, and uh, but they uh, set up different sounds or uh, different uh, vibrations for particular uh, particular contacts uh, that they want to be notified and uh, because you know there are like nowadays especially nowadays when we go everyone goes offline online it means that you like you can be bombarded with different notifications from different applications because the notification it's uh, right now it's like the only way of how we can how application can uh, uh, return back the user. So they send a notification and you will see this notification. Maybe you will open the other uh, application. But um, we have we can control and we can prioritize our uh, prioritize our uh, notification. Uh, for example, if I uh, uh, if I open the notification from the from uh, from the notification manager, I will see this uh, uh, and the settings, uh, if I long press on the notification notification manager, I will see this uh, settings. So the new setting that was added, it's a priority setting. So if I press it, uh, if I press on the priority, then the notification will be changed. So uh, the, you will see uh, that uh, the icon, the icon goes a bit um, uh, yellow. And uh, it means that this notification is uh, um, like, like you, 
uh, signal the, the you send a signal to a system that uh, this is this uh, conversation is very important for you so the next time uh, so uh, it will be always on top of the conversation section it doesn't matter uh, whether the, uh, other notifications will be will bombard you with uh, with messages, uh, still this uh, um, top priority, still this notification will be a top priority. And one tiny thing is uh, that uh, when you go directly to the, uh, to when you uh, when you uh, when you look in, into the status bar, the priority notification will uh, have kind of an icon of your contact. But, uh, funny thing, but yeah, tiny detail, but very interesting and funny. Okay, and. Uh, but we can go directly to the settings of the application and tune the settings for each of the uh, uh, bubble there as well. So if we open the settings of the application, we will see all the list, uh, the whole list of your conversation that you have from this application. And um, you can go directly one by one. Uh, for example, if I tap on the, on the, on the, on the conversation from my dog, I will go directly to a new screen where I can um, set up the, uh, the settings for this particular uh, conversation. So, and the, the, uh, there are two main and important uh, uh, settings. The first one is uh, bubble this conversation. Uh, if, for example, you turn it off, if you set it, turn it off, then the bubble will disappear if you, if you have uh, the, the conversation as a bubble. Uh, so the bubble will disappear, but you always next time when you receive a conversation you still you still have an option to make it uh, a bubble out of it uh, the second point which is quite important is uh, not a not a conversation so if you mark that this conversation is uh, used uh, is misused or used incorrectly so some for example uh, any like for example, one application decides that they want to um, to send you a push message and to send you a notification, and they uh, decided to use a conversation. Uh, they set up everything in order to be in this conversation section, so you can go directly into this conversation and mark it as a notification, as not a conversation. And the next time, the notification will will be just a normal notification without, uh, so it will appear in this notification section. So it will never be appear in the uh, conversation section. And the last not least, you can go directly to the settings of the all bubbles. So it will open your uh, a new screen where you can control how you are going to uh, work with uh, with your bubble. So it can be all conversation. Uh, you can mark that all conversation will be opened as bubbles or a selected conversation, or you can delete a particular bubbles uh, with uh, uh, with uh, this um, uh, cross cross icon, and the same, almost the same. You can uh, you can look, uh, you can see when you open, for example, bubble. There is like a manage uh, uh, icon or manage button. When you click, you will see just a uh, small pop up where you can control how the bubble will behave. So yeah, uh, that's all what we have about the bubbles, but. I want to summarize. I want to make a short summary out of everything that we talked about. Like, I think that uh, I don't want to, to decide uh, here. I don't want to make any decision. So I want to leave a uh, decision uh, on you so you can decide whether to use a bubble API or not. I think that the, the good thing that uh, Google, uh, I already told it, but uh, I will repeat it, that uh, Google unified the API. And um, this is one key, uh, key point. And um, they unify the API and everybody seems to go this way so they can use it. Of course, you should be very careful in order not to bombard or not to uh, misuse the, this API like conversation or bubble API. So yeah, uh, here you, you, you have a choice how to, to, how, to, how to behave, but please do it wisely. And, and at the end, I want to uh, maybe uh, uh, after the summary, I want to uh, to say some words on the maybe popular questions that you maybe already ask in the chat or thinking about to ask. Uh, the first one is that <laughs> if you Google in the internet and uh, uh, and uh, Google in the internet how to disable this chat has from Facebook Messenger, you will find so many popular answers on the on the YouTube or videos, lots of videos and everything. So 
people are not very um, maybe they do not understand how to use it correctly or maybe the application do, they do not use how to use it correctly so people are a bit afraid of uh, such uh, bubbles bubbles on top of the screen I think that here uh, Google have a good possibility to work with companies, with application, with developers, to uh, to and users, of course, users to uh, make it like a habit and to to give them to to give the users the understanding how to use it correctly and how the application should uh, should behave in that case. And the second question is the backwards uh, compatible is bubble backward compatible yes there is a all everything is backward compatible so there is a support uh, package where you can uh, compact package uh, where you can um, where, where, which you can use uh, so the the, the so the uh, underneath the system will decide whether it will set for example bubble metadata or will do nothing uh, at the end I want to share some resources that I used Basically, the most important resource is this code lab that I used uh, heavily, and my example was based on this uh, based on this code lab, uh, where you can try you on your own bubbles and all this notification stuff, and a bunch of links that can help you to better understand how the conversation behave and how the bubbles uh, behave. So thank you very much. I hope that you enjoyed this section. I hope that I tried, uh, that I answered some of the questions that you have before, and I hope that you find it interesting. If you have any questions, please uh, ask me. I will try to answer you. Yay. Okay. Cool. <laughs> we did it. We reached the end. Yeah. We so we have uh, one question. Uh, are there any changes in notification service listener interface behavior activation? Notification service listener interface behavior activation. Um, I do not know exactly because I did not uh, uh, did not look into this uh, service uh, listener. Maybe, but yeah, I can't answer here. But yeah. Maybe we can check check it out later. Cool. Um, we don't have more questions, but I have a question for you. So basically, you mentioned the uh, Facebook uh, bubble, uh, or actually the chat heads that here they introduced a long time ago. So uh, why bubble is preferred than uh, than uh, fa uh, than Facebook chat heads? They're using the same approach with uh, having transparent active activity with a. Uh, uh, with the foreground service that running and uh, hosting all this stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, as I said, uh, like it's a like bubble. It's a new. Uh, it's a new level. It's kind of a new API that um, uh, gives the possibility to 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 do this uh, to do the same stuff. But it done uh, underneath on the framework level. So the 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 the, the, the mechanism that uh, that uh, Facebook used. So it's like something different. So they use this permission system alert window, which uh, Google is trying to deprecate and it will be deprecated in the next releases. And um, they use kind of a custom custom mechanism um, that is that is no, not a, a good way to do like, yeah, for, for sure it, um, uh, solves the, it solves the problem, but um, uh, Google tries to, uh, to Put uh, like to put all these problems and try to solve it with a new API, which is uh, which is Bubble Bubble API. Cool. So thank you a lot, Pavel, for your time, thank you. for, your thank you, yeah. thank for you a lot of investment in the in the presentation and bringing us the uh, the most important and uh, uh, insightful topics today. <laughs> thank you a lot. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Also, thank you for Michael that here yeah, as well. Thank you, guys, for listening and thank you for your supper. <laughs> cool. Yeah. So I want just uh, to remind folks that uh, we have a feedback form. Uh, we post it in the chat. Also, it's there as a description in the video. Please, 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 please fill it. Uh, give us a opportunity to improve and make our events better and learn how we can make better. Um, so. Thank you yeah. for all. Thank and you. See you next time on the 4th of August. We will talk about the jetpack, about Dagger Hilt, 
uh, about pagination library, the new one that came out, and uh, Jetpack activity result, upstart, and many more. Thank yeah. you all, and have a nice evening. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.